Well, good afternoon and welcome back to another video, this time on the book of Exodus. Perhaps you've already listened to Carl's talk uh, uh, just a few days ago, introducing you to some of the major themes of Exodus. I want to focus on one particular part, and that is on the law. Of course, <clears throat> we understand that the book of Exodus uh, was where we find the covenant of the law. Now, of course, as covenant theologians, we believe in the that the scripture has been organized by way of covenants. And if we go back and remember our history, we'll see how the covenant of law fits into that series of covenants. At the very beginning, we see in Genesis 3 where God had the, the covenant of commencement with Adam. And then moving along to Genesis 8, we had the covenant of preservation where we have Noah and God preserves the people to himself. And then follows that the, the covenant of promise that God has with Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15, 17 and other places where he promises Abraham land, seed and blessing. Well, the next covenant that comes in that series is the covenant of law, specifically as we see in Exodus uh, and maybe in particular, we'd say in Exodus 20, that contains the moral law of the Ten Commandments. Now, for, following that, we're going to also see the covenant of the kingdom and the new covenant. Those will come later. We'll point those out to you as we go through <clears throat> excuse me, our continued Bible read through. Now we see in Exodus that the law is now being codified. It's being written down. We see the, of course, the Ten Commandments being carved into those two tablets of stone. Uh, but the, the whole law now is being written down for the people so they know how they are to live before God as God's people. Now this is not, of course, the first time the people have ever been exposed to any kind of commandments or revelation from God. For example, we see Cain and Abel, even as early as Genesis 4, who are offering sacrifices. And there's one that's acceptable and the one that's not. Apparently there has been communication from God uh, for them to know what the difference is. We also read about Abraham in Genesis 26, that he followed God's charge and God's commandments and God's statutes and God's law. Uh, these hadn't been written down to our knowledge before then. <clears throat> but here we see a Abraham all the way back in Genesis 26, who uh, understands that there are principles to live by. There are commandments of the Lord and uh, statutes uh, by which he is to live. But it's not until we get to Exodus that we see the actual codification and writing down of these laws <clears throat> for all the people. Now, what is the purpose of the law? The law actually has three purposes, as we are uh, told by Calvin. We talked about this in our series on uh, Galatians, but let me just refresh your memory. The first purpose of the law is to reflect. And that is to reflect. Think of it as a mirror. It reflects the, the glory of God and the, great, the greatness of our God, the magnificence and perfections of God. But it also reflects our sinfulness. When we look into those pages, as we read in James, we look back and we can see ourselves in the scriptures describing us as our hearts are deceitful, as we are selfish and proud people. And we see then the glory and the beauty of God and we see our sinfulness and we recognize that there's this massive uh, incalculable gap between the two, something that we could never bridge on our own and reminding us that if there is going to be some kind of meeting of these two, uh, it's going to have to come from God. It can, can never come from us to suggest that we can work our way to him is, is to completely misunderstand our own sin as well as God's own glory. The second purpose of the law is to restrict. <clears throat> might think of it as a use in the civil realm, in the, in the public realm. For a theocracy such as Israel, there were all kinds of laws. There were sacrificial laws. There were ceremonial laws. There were civil laws. Uh, we can think of uh, any number of the laws that you read in the Old Testament that are case laws of how to apply the basic principles of the Ten Commandments into that particular society at that particular time. So you have lots of laws related to animals, lost animals and animals that are hurt and all these kinds of things, <clears throat> and different kinds of interaction among the people, a lot of farming kinds of uh, applications. These are all drawn from the principles of the Ten Commandment and codified for the people at that time in a civil realm. Uh, the third use is to reveal that is to reveal the will of God to us. That is to reveal to us how the Lord would have us live. Uh, what would he have us do? Would we have different situations regarding, say, Lord's Day or work or relationships or losses or theft? 
how should we deal with those? And the Lord reveals those to us, and particularly just how we are to live personally, our, our heart attitudes, and how we are to make decisions, what, what templates, what statutes, what commands, what principles uh, should we use when we make decisions as we go through day-to-day -day life, as we raise our children, as we relate to other people. <clears throat> now, the important thing to remember here, there's a lot of people that make the mistake, make mistakes regarding the law. Some completely jettison the law. They say in the New Testament, there is no law anymore, so we need to just get rid of it. And others will add to the law, or they'll say, well, you have to use the law. You have to be a good person and get to heaven. That is, you have to go to church, you have to tithe, you have to, and they look at the law as a means of earning a way to heaven. Well, both of those are completely wrong. We don't throw out the law, nor do we see law as a part of our salvation. Remember what happened in Exodus. The people were saved out of Egypt. The redemption came first then, and then came the law. The law was something that came after for God's people, for God's people to know how they were to live. So we first have the the redemption, and then you have the sanctification. You can think of it this way. The first use of the law to reflect that gap between God and man is part of our justification, reminding us that we need a Savior. We need a way to be redeemed and to reconcile. But the third part of the law in particular, in regards to our own sanctification, not the civil realm, which was the second, although that has its own application, but particularly for us here, it reveals to us how we're to live. Now that we're believers, now that we've been redeemed, how are we to live? Uh, the Ten Commandments, that is not something that's just an Old Testament concept. It's something for the New Testament. For example, we read Jesus in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus says to uh, this individual, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first four commandments of the Ten Commandments are those that are the vertical commandments between us and God. How we're to worship and when we're to worship. Uh, whom we're to worship. <clears throat> these are all answered in that first, in the first four parts of the, of the law. Then the next six laws are, are horizontal. They're how we are to deal with with other people. <clears throat> and so God says, and Jesus says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So we can trace all the laws back to these 10 moral laws. And again, what does this mean for us as believers today? <clears throat> How are we to understand the law? I think Romans 8 is very helpful for us here. We read in Romans 8, in verse 2, verses 2 through 4, the following For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. There we see that first use of the law. It, says it made us weak. We couldn't do it. And so God had to send his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for that reconciliation. But then verse 4 follows right on that. And it's not even, it's a comma, it's not even a period. He says he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So there it is. For us believers, that's the third use of the law. It reveals to us how we are to live. We are now empowered, now that we've been redeemed, now that we've been regenerated, and we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now we can do the law as God has called us. We don't do it perfectly, but now we're enabled in a way that we never were in the past. As an unbeliever, you are unable to please God. Again, it says this in Romans 8, the carnal mind cannot please the Lord, but you are spiritually minded if you are his. And in so being, uh, you can now fulfill his law and you desire to do so. You, you take the, the words in your lips that were those of the King David when he said, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Or when he said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That should be the testimony of every believer now. We love God's law. We love it because he has saved us to it, and by it we can please him. So those are some thoughts for today as you go through your book of Exodus.